Joey, and my day job, I'm a restoration coastal ecologist, but today I'm speaking as the lead organizer for TEDx for Million Street, which was Lafayette's inaugural TEDx event that occurred this past September. And I want to use my experiences in tackling this task of bringing TEDx to Lafayette um, to encourage you to tackle tasks that may seem larger than life as well. And so I want to start off, this is an advancing, by quoting my favorite Saturday Night Live uh, inspired film, Superstar. And so in this film, the lead, Mary Catherine Gallagher, explains that there are two ways of getting into a pool. One, you take your toe, you carefully test the water to its temperature, and feel if it's okay, and then slowly get in, letting your water, or letting your body adjust to the cold. And then the other way is to jump. And whether it's been for my betterment or detriment, I've always been more of the jump mentality. Um, I jumped when I left my home in Nebraska to come to Louisiana where I didn't know anyone. I didn't know that I would be successful in graduating from grad school. And I didn't know how to pronounce half the street names or menu items here. Uh, recently, I jumped when I brought home a stray dog without consulting my roommates or landlord. And this past uh, year, I took a big jump when I decided to apply for a license to host a TEDx event in Lafayette. And so, for those of you not already familiar, TED is an international nonprofit organization, stands for Technology Entertainment Design, and they're dedicated to ideas worth spreading. And they do this through hosting conferences where they invite the world's leading thinkers and doers to speak on their big ideas worth spreading. And as you can see, Here's a picture of Bill Gates giving his TED Talk to get some pretty big names. And although everybody can watch TED Talks online, not everybody can attend a TED event. So, as a part of their mission towards ideas worth spreading, TED formed a free franchise called TEDx, where communities can independently organize their own TED-like experiences and highlight the leading thinkers and doers in their own community and spread a Good ideas worth spreading that are formed in your own community through the rest of the world. And so these events happen all over the world. Um, but before last year, it had never before occurred in Lafayette, Louisiana, until I took a jump and applied for a license. Um, so today I want to speak on what we learned from doing this event that can be utilized by anyone attempting your own big projects of your own um, to either help you face down those pesky obstacles that keep us from taking risks or taking that jump, or if you've already taken a jump into something, uh, maybe some of our insights can help you safely land on your feet. So, let's start off by talking about jump obstacles. These are the little things and little notions of self-doubt that prevent us from taking on our dream projects. And two of the most common uh, are that one, I don't have the time, or two, I don't have the expertise, the knowledge, uh, to be able to do it. So let's start off by talking about the um, lack of time issue that a lot of people seem to have. Let's say this is the average day for the average person. You sleep your recommended eight hours, you work your mandatory eight hours, you spend about four hours a day eating, bathing, doing laundry, feeding the dog, whatever chores. That leaves you with a glorious four hours a day for fun, just whatever you want to do, right? Well, when I took on the project of hosting a TEDx event, I was in the last semester of my PhD, so I was getting ready to defend my dissertation, while at the same time looking for a job, while at the same time moving into a new house. So let's just say, hypothetically, that maybe my workload was a bit more than the average day. Um, and so, but that's at the expense of your sleep, right? You do that for a while until all of your loved ones start to tell you, Taylor, you look so tired. <laughs> Shame, well, I'm looking at you. Uh, <laughs> so you take back your sleep hours, but now this is at the expense of your fun time. And then you realize you're still in your 20s and there's a lot of festivals to go here. So now you've taken this out of your self-maintenance time, so you streamline your morning routine and you learn to eat without making dishes, okay? All joking aside though, what I'm saying is that you will never feel like you have enough time to do what you want to do. But you probably do have that time, you just need to reorganize things, 
uh, allocate time away from places where you're previously spending it, or uh, have to increase your self-discipline a bit so that you can get everything done. So that's our first solution. Uh, make time and jump anyway. Another way to build time for any project that you're working on is to bring in other passionate people. Uh, this is our core organizing team for TEDx for Million Street. And all these people are friends of mine who were each living schedules that were just as, if not more, busy than my own. But they were interested in being a part of this event. And by working with this talented group of people, I quickly found that the small amount of time per day that I could allocate to the project was multiplied by the number of teammates that I had, each possessing different lives and schedules and different uh, areas of expertise and connections of their own. So, the second solution for a lack of time is to delegate. All right, the second obstacle that a lot of people claim that prevent them from jumping into what they want to do is that they don't have the expertise. Well, you probably don't know everything you're going to need to know to figure something out uh, at the beginning of the project. And that scares a lot of people. Either one, because they're scared of having to learn something new, or two, they're scared that they won't be able to learn it and that they'll fail. When I applied for the TEDx license, I had never done anything like that before. I never held a big event. I've never had to go around begging for sponsorship. I've never had to advertise a big event. Um, I knew that I had a lot to learn. So the first recommendation from our experiences would be to just trust in yourself. Trust that, put faith in yourself that you, just because you've never had to do something before doesn't mean that you're doomed to never be able to figure it out. Um, I will say, of course, that it's a lot easier when you have people with that experience or people that you can go to with questions uh, that have the experience. So my second piece of advice would be to trust in your inner circle. My team is composed of a relatively diverse group of people with multidisciplinary backgrounds, and most people had at least some experience in part of the objectives that we had to accomplish, but no one had really done anything quite like this before. So more importantly than their experience in doing something like this before, all of my teammates had a willingness to learn and to grow. And so that's something I think is incredibly important to find in your teammates is that they too are willing to learn. Now, even if we had known how to do everything, um, bringing this event to fruition really went well beyond our team. And so that brings me to my next point, which is Trust in your community's resources. There are a lot of businesses and organizations and uh, services in our community that may be more willing to help you out than you would imagine. Um, for example, we had to find a venue to hold this event. So I approached Gert Wusterman at the Acadiana Center for the Arts with the idea of bringing TEDx uh, to their theater. And that's really where we got our first stroke of confidence um, he donated the space to us, and um, that really helped, put, helped us put faith in ourselves to produce an event that's worthy of being at the ACA. Um, we also had to drum up sponsorship to help foot the bill. So we got connected with Pete Prados at Innovate. Um, if you haven't met him yet, meet him today. And he really helped connect us with um, businesses around Acadiana that would be interested in investing in an event like this. Um, opportunity machines being covered up there. But if a good way to kind of find that sponsorship is to look at other events that have similar missions as your own, look who's sponsoring them and go to those organizations. Um, and we wanted to provide food at the event and in true Lafayette style, Local restaurants, rather than make us sign some sort of exclusivity agreement, they formed their own collaborative to provide free food for the event. And it was some of the best restaurants in town. We actually had a surplus of food that was able to be donated to the city mission. Um, we wanted to film the events, but again, renting cameras is expensive and it's even harder to find people that can work them. So the Acadiana Open Channel donated a tech crew and they the equipment and they filmed the event for us. And um, we really found that when you approach local businesses and organizations, they were interested in helping us get this event off the ground too. Uh, 
much more surprising than I had imagined going into it. And so the final point I want to make is trust in your community. Um, these are the strangers that you don't know and the people that aren't going to necessarily benefit off of your success like a company that invests in you to have their logo on it would. For TEDx, we had to get people that were willing to present their ideas to the world, to apply to speak. And we ended up getting over 110 speaker applications for our first year, of which we selected 13 speakers. And we had people that ranged all sorts of disciplines, from public officials working to beautify their community, to college students working to bring in new campus organizations, from scientists, to philosophers, to even the mayor. So we got people interested in spreading their own ideas, but we also had to trust that people would show up to attend the event, to attend an intellectual event on a Cajun home game day, nonetheless. We were allowed to sell 100 tickets with our license, and we sold out in an hour and a half. So Lafayette wanted this event to come here, um, and that was another huge um, stroke of confidence in us to help us produce a good event. We also needed a large number of volunteers that didn't necessarily need to be involved along the whole way, but we needed people for the day of. And we had a huge outpouring of support from people that wanted to help that day, and they were running registration tables, helping guests get oriented, and just helping make the day easier for everyone. And um, we really owe them a lot of support. Um, and praise. You see, in a town like Lafayette, it's easy to get connected with the right people. In this town, people want you to succeed at making their community a better place. They want to be supportive of you. Now, I was extremely lucky to have a very talented and intelligent inner circle. I was extremely lucky to meet Pete Prados at Innovate, who connected me with my community circle. And I was lucky to get to use an internationally renowned brand like TED. Not everybody gets that opportunity to use a brand name that's already trusted and invested in. But attending events like today are an excellent opportunity to meet people that can help you build um, the time and the expertise that you need to get your project off the ground. Um, you can't do it alone and you shouldn't try. It's much better to have other people along the ride. Um, so, although today is a great event for that kind of networking and opportunity, um, we really need more events like this in town, so I'm going to bring up Butch Roussel, who's one of our TEDx for Million Street uh, 2015 speakers, and he's going to talk about um, his 48-hour citizen project, which helps people with big ideas get connected with uh, people that can help them get it off the ground. citizens was that we also told them in releasing it that this tool would allow them to pursue their ideas for the community, right? Particularly if they care about the spaces that they live in. And so we gave them the tool in, a, in about a year and a half time. We've engaged with 366 citizens. We've crowdfunded $50,000 through 10 projects, right? And so if you had just heard the, the talk that Jared just gave about crowdfunding your business, you would look at this and say that this is a really small number and these are, these are really small victories. But it was interesting to see the, tool, the people of the community use the tools. And so when we talk about tools, we also have to talk about the projects that were involved and what, what the citizens had to go through to pursue those projects. And this is an example here. You see, about a year ago, I had a friend of mine come to me and say, um, I want drinking water fountains in my community. 
And so, I you know, said, so what, what do you mean? I mean, you know, there, there should be enough water fountains in the community, you know, go to your parks nearby. And he said, no. He said, you know, I, I'm an avid runner, and I do these 10, 20 mile long runs, and I plan my running routes around drinking water faucets, or more like dirty drinking water fa faucets around the community. He said, I think there's a need for drinking water fountains in areas where people run. So well, great, well, let's go have coffee. So we sat down and we said this was an idea worthy of pursuing. And so this is kind of, kind of what our brains kind of came to. This was what we drafted as a perfect plan for execution uh, for getting drinking water fountains around Lafayette. I first talked about the number of fountains in the community. How many could the, could the community support? We said 15, we said 20, we said maybe even 30. OK, we'll come back to that later. We talked about fountain design. We said that we live in Acadiana where there's sort of this artistic appeal. There's an abundance of artists and sculptors. Maybe we could have launch a community contest and have some of the artists design the fountains. And if that didn't work, well, then we would just go to the local university and use college students. We said the cost would be somewhere around $1,000. We were going to strategically place them around Lafayette in a perfect 26.2 mile loop. And we were both UL graduates. So we said we wanted to put it in the shape, draw a map in the shape of a UL Raging Cajun hand symbol. Right? We were going to call it the Raging Cajun loop. So the timeline would be somewhere around 30 days for funding, another 30 days for uh, construction. We're going to have it completely built in 60 days. We're going to crowdfund the project and we knew the community love it. And so that was definitely our brain on coffee. But this right here um, is a depiction of what we really thought about our idea at the time. We thought it was so good that we were going to put it in this pretty little box, put a cute bow on top, and we are going to share it with other communities around Acadiana and then go statewide, right? We were going to rid thirst forever with just drinking water fountains. And so this is kind of that same depiction, just in graph form. There was a direct correlation between the amount of cups of coffee that you consume and your ambition. Uh, there was a direct, or there was a, a disconnect between the ideal that we had imagined and reality. So when you look at this project, uh, in retrospect, we need to understand what the reality really was. It was eight fountains, it wasn't 15, it wasn't 30. Um, it was not a region Cajun hand uh, symbol, it was a really ugly map that looked like this, and it wasn't a 26.2 mile loop at all. Um, we thought that the two of us could take on the projects ourselves, minus a plumber and a handyman, but we needed over 10 volunteers. And that perfect plan for execution wasn't so perfect after all. Um, that plan became smaller and less less significant over time. We thought that we began to fail our community time and time again, and also fail ourselves and our friends. So after a long battle of trying to pursue this project and do something good in the community, one year later, not 60 days later, um, we have broke ground on our first set of fountains, and this is one that UL had designed. We crowdfunded $15,000 in 60 days and now have begun installing the fountains around the community. So that's one, you know, one small project, a lot of work um, that we put into. But it's important to point out that not all of our citizen-led projects that we work on are created the same. Uh, this is a park that, that downtown uh, had come to us right after we had launched. And they said that they went to take over a parking spot uh, right over right off of Jefferson Street across from Carpe Diem and Pops Poe Boys and put a parklet. So we, should, we said, sure. Well, our first question was, what was a parklet? And so we did some research and realized what a parklet was. And then we said, this is a great idea. We put together a quick video, a project description. We launched on Tuesday morning. It was fully funded in four and a half hours. And this is the parklet here. Um, but you know what we, what we realized and looking at the Parklet project, because yeah, it was a success, and yes, it was kind of it wasn't a big headache like the the uh, water fountain project, but we created something more than just a structure along Jefferson Street. We created a place where people can congregate, a place where friends gather, they, they share drinks, and we created moments of conversations. We also created a place where um, where artists can showcase their art during art walk, right? 
And so when you, when you take into consideration both of these projects, there's one thing that comes to mind whenever we evaluate our community. And that's, I think, as citizens and probably as public officials, we have this propensity to look at solutions for our community as long-term visions. When we think about the Lafayette Comprehensive Plan, when you think about the I-49 connector that's been being talked about for over a decade, but we often, and those things are important, don't get me wrong, but we often forget to think about the short-term solutions or those small victories that are available to us right now. And it's those small victories that actually create excitement amongst the community. Um, you know, I don't know about you, but as a citizen of Lafayette, I become impatient. And I, I want to see things being built. And so when you think about community or citizen-led projects, uh, what better person to pursue those short-term solutions than a citizen themselves? And so the byproduct of a of a citizen pursuing a community project, similar to the two that I just talked about, is that they begin to fall more and more in love their, with their community each time that they pursue one of those projects or be a part of them. And so that in itself is a, is a small victory. And so when we look at this, this concept, and again, taking into consideration the projects, we, we, come, we come back and we say, well, there, there are voices in the community that really make a difference. And I believe that there are three voices. There's the I wants, the I wills, and the you cans. The I wants are those citizens that have an opinion about creating the spaces for which they want to live. Those ideas can be big, they can be small, and we took these chalkboard signs to people of all ages around the community and we've been gathering feedback. And so these are the I wants, the citizens <laughs> in the community. Uh, the, the second voice in the community is the you cans. The you cans are the public officials and those key decision makers that empower us to do things, to do better. And they empower us to act. They empower us to act in a way in a way that you know we feel compelled to do so even whenever we don't know the best way to get there. I think the underlying theme here is that they want us to lead. And the third and final voice in the community is the I wills. The I wills are the businesses. The businesses that support the ideas of the I wants. And so as an organization, we've been, um, we've, we've launched obviously about a year and a half ago. And so we have to take a step back from time to time and evaluate some of the things that we're doing and some of the, uh, the projects that we really want to pursue. And so there's a concept that we're working on right now, we're sharing, and we're very much in the preliminary stages of it, but we call it the 48-hour citizen project. And it kind of takes into consideration these voices and, and the tools that people need to actually pursue their ideas and create the spaces that they want to live in. So the first question that I, that I ask is, imagine in your head what a community or, or what your community's organizational chart looks like. And when you do that, it probably looks something like this, at least initially. Um, this is the San Francisco organizational chart. You've got your mayor, your parish president somewhere at the top. You've got, you've got your, um, your city council somewhere below. You've got all of your inspectors below that. And so what you see is this kind of top-down approach, right? You've, you, you've got an umbrella of the UCANs and the public officials who are looking out for the best interests of the citizens. And under that, you have the businesses and the citizens kind of um, existing together in this bubble. And so this is kind of the idea that at least I have of, of how, um, how my community organization works, right? In, a very, in very simple terms, obviously. But let's, let's take this a step further. And let's say that the I wants and you cans, maybe they don't talk often enough, right? But, but what if they did? What if you put the I wants, you cans, and the I wills together in the same room at the same time, and you ask the I wants, those citizens of the community, to come together and collaborate on the, their ideas. You ask them to form teams or pods of people that come together, they collaborate, and provide all of the resources that they need to pursue that idea. And then at that same time, you bring the you cans. The you cans, the public officials and key decision makers that come in a very direct way and collaborate with the citizens of the community. They approve and they vet those ideas. 
And then lastly, you bring in the I wills, the businesses to the same room to hear the pitch of the I wants, the I wants approved embedded ideas. And the I wills fund those ideas, right? And we do this all in 48 hours, from a Friday to a Sunday, a fun creative event where we completely break down the barriers between the I wants, the you cans, and the I wills in order to create change. There's no top-down top approach. We bring them all to the same place at the same time for a complete collaborative um, event. We have an opportunity through the 48-hour citizen project to engage citizens and public officials in a way that they've never done before. Um, we can increase the number of community pro projects, and we can convert private funding towards public projects. And of course, we'll put this this uh, project in a pretty box and we'll put a bow on top and we're going to share it with other communities, right? And it seems ambitious, uh, but I think it could be had, and I think Lafayette is a perfect place to do this um, because I think we have an opportunity to be an example to other communities alike. And I'm going to end with this here, by the way, if you've never forecasted your goals through a newspaper channel online, you're really missing out. Uh, but this is uh, kind of... Uh, uh, you know, kind of a future look at where I see communities are going. One of the top trends of our decade has been sharing, um, and sharing through technology. And so I, my prediction is that that same trend will continue, but it will grow into something much bigger, uh, something, something like an open source citizenry or a do-it-yourself community, where through technology we can build a repository or a database of citizens that really want to be a part of the community. And we gauge their interest um, and are able to put them on projects or develop teams uh, where <coughs> citizens could really be a part. We also have an opportunity to engage with our local government so that they could come up with ideas for which citizens can pursue on their own. They're these kind of these small victories or these uh, these short-term solutions and communities that city planners can put together. So we'll be um, we'll be starting some of the promoting for the 48-hour citizen project hopefully sometime after the first of the year. Uh, and we're currently gathering volunteers to help in whatever capacity that might be. So please come grab me after if uh, if you have any interest or you just want to kind of talk about the concept. Um, we would we'd love to hear. So thank you. Questions for, for myself or for Taylor? Same question to both of you. What prompted you to take the plunge? Uh, I actually saw, I did speech and debate through college and saw my old friends giving TED Talks in their own communities back home. And I thought, I, I want to do a TED Talk. But it uh, took a while looking into it that we didn't have the event. And if you organize it, you can't give a talk anyway. But it's more fun to be on that side. For me, I, I travel a bunch for work. And um, I had a lot of friends in the community that were really involved, whether it be through the 75 or single boards. And uh, I felt like I couldn't, um, because I was gone so much, I couldn't kind of share that same contribution to the community. So I had to do it in a way through a web presence, where it was something that I could do remotely and connect with people through the web, um, because I wasn't here all the time. And so that was kind of my, my plunge. You know, I, I couldn't be here all the time and I had to not beat myself up because I couldn't be sitting in a board meeting or couldn't be participating on a seven or five things. I could be sitting in a hotel in San Francisco, um, you know, helping helping people pursue ideas through crowdfunding. Any other questions? Well thanks for uh, attending. Yeah. Thanks guys. Thanks again to the doctor.